All right, if you want to uh, get out your Bibles, we're going to be in Psalm 73 this morning, and we'll, we'll get to that in just, in just a second. Um, and we'll be going through the entire, the entire psalm, and it's, it's a little bit lengthy, but uh, I trust the Lord has something to speak to us about it. So as I begin this morning, I just want you to think for a second, have you ever flipped through a magazine or watched TV or spent some time browsing through the Internet? You're most likely very familiar with ads that pop up that there's a variety of products that they're trying to, to sell to you, and they have before and after images. Ads for diets, diet drinks, weight loss plans that have before and after pictures to show, you, to show you how good that these drinks are, that these plans are. There's people before and people after to show you the benefits of, of following this plan, and they have some unbelievable, literally unbelievable results to show you. There's exercise machines that can tone any part of your body that's a little bit flabby, along with the photos, again, to pr pr prove that they are effective. Guys, are you losing some hair? Well, there's numerous products out there that can help you get it all back, and they've got the photos to prove it. There's creams to clear up your skin problems, melt away your cellulite, whiten your teeth, straighten your teeth, change your hair color, each with photos to pr prove beyond any doubt of their validity in, in achieving these claims. I even saw an ad recently for toe fungus with the before <laughs> and the after. This morning, though, we're going to take a look at Psalm 73, and we're going to see that this psalm reads a little bit like some of these ads. There's a, the first half of the psalm paints a picture of a man who is grappling with a nagging observation that's based on a, on a wrong perspective of life. In verse 17, we're going to see him come about to a, a realization, something that changes his perspective. In the last half of the psalm, we read about his new understanding and his view of life and, this, and the reality that we live in in light of this new perspective. So we have a before and an after image of this man of God. So stand with me as we read Psalm 73 this morning. Truly, God is good to Israel. To those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily they threaten the op oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongues strut to the earth. Therefore his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, How can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. All in vain I have kept my heart clean. And washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. Truly you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O oh Lord, when you, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in my heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom I have in heaven but you, and there is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish, but you, you, and you put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all of your works. Lord, we thank you for this psalm. For the heart of this man who's confessing his um, sinful tendencies and his desires and his envy, his jealousy. 
But then we see him encounter his God in your sanctuary, and it changes his life. It changes his perspective. Lord, may we too encounter you this morning through your word, in Jesus' name. Amen. So this psalm is written by Asaph. He is a man uh, who is likely unknown to many of us, but he was one of King David's chief musicians. He was one of three men that orchestrated much of the singing in Israelite, the community. He was basically the Perry of the Jewish community. And in the course of time, Asaph became one of the leaders of the Jewish worship team. He was a songwriter and a man who wrote many songs and many of them which we find in the book of Psalms in our Bibles. In Psalm 73, Asaph writes a song about an experience that we have all had at one time or another. We look around us and it seems like the bad guys are winning and the good guys are losing. We see the wicked prospering and we see the good suffering. People who don't know God and don't love him, people who are not concerned for living life God's ways, and those who live selfish, arrogant lives seems to be the ones who are enjoying a life free of burdens. Meanwhile, we see believers suffering at one time or another. Who hasn't looked at this and asked themselves, what's wrong with this picture that I see? Is, isn't God good to his people? Are his promises sure? Are they trustworthy? If so, then how do I understand the apparent success of the wicked and the suffering of the righteous? Why do the wicked prosper? Let's begin by considered, considering Asaph's observations based on his before perspective. It was a man-centered, it's a short-term perspective, and I'm going to reread a, a section of this psalm and listen carefully to his perspective as he looks around him. He begins, Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are, in, they are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongues struts to the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long, I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said, I, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. In Scripture, we're encouraged not to grow weary, not to grow, grow tired of doing good. But the reality is that we, just, we do grow tired. We do go weary of, of trying to do good. It's especially true when we don't see any immediate benefit to our, our, our fruit from our obedience. We live in a society and culture that is fast-paced. We can't wait for anything. We want it, and we want it now. We go to Burger King to get burgers made our way. We search out the shortest line at the grocery store. How many times have we grown weary in our desire to obey and please God when they don't see it, we don't see an immediate payoff? It's especially true when they see those around us, the unbelievers in particular, who seem to get everything that they want. Our interpretation, our interpretation of God's goodness contributes to our discernment as well. Do we evaluate God's goodness based on our level of present happiness? Do we evaluate his goodness based on our temporal and personal happiness that we're experiencing right now in the moment? Does our view of happiness, hap happen to, does our view of happiness have to do with things that are physical, that are external and immediate? If so, it's going to be hard to imagine for us to imagine a God who could be good and not give us those things right now. We want the good life and we want it now. We look around us and we're filled with jealousy at what others, others have. We see the lives of all those social media influences, influencers and we're tempted to envy. Look at them. We see their beautiful clothes. We see their wonderful trips that they take, their amazing shape, and they seem to have no cares in this world. And we wonder, why do the wicked prosper? 
So let's look at Asaph's confession for insight into his thoughts before his encounter with God that we'll look at in a little bit. He's confessing for him what was a nearly disastrous fall or a slip, a stumble that he was experiencing due to his, what I would say was a flawed uh, perspective on, on life. And it's interesting that, Saul, that Asaph begins this psalm with these words. It's a, it's a statement of absolute truth about who, who God is. It begins, truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Asaph knows this be, to be true, and he's confessing that to himself. He's stating a truth about God. He's reminding himself of it. He's reminding us of it. He's reminding his readers of it. But we've all heard things similar to this, sim similar to this when people are going through tough times. They say something just like Asaph says, I know that God is good, but what comes next? It's that nasty three-letter word, but. I know that God is good, but. I know that God loves me, but. I know that God is sovereign, but. And Asaph begins the same way. He says, I know that God is good to Israel. I know that God is good to those who are pure in heart. Then in verse 2, there's that three-letter word, but. But as for me, Asaph then makes a startling confession. This man of God, the worship leader of Israel, he says, but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. Asaph arouses our, our curiosity. He starts off with a wonderful declaration and then jumps into that dreaded but. Why? Well, he tells us in verse 3, he says, I was envious, I was jealous, I wanted what the arrogant have, and I was jealous of them when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He was distracted. Something had distracted him, something he saw was taking his, his focus and his gaze away from, from God. His gaze was diverted. He saw some of the wicked people around him prospering, and he became envious of them. Trouble always begins when we take our eyes off of God and place them on something else. When God isn't our complete focus and the object of our attention, when God isn't the reason for our joy, when God isn't the reason for our happiness, when we get distracted, when our gaze is diverted, when we look, some, look for satisfaction somewhere else, trouble is around the corner. Asaph is confessing to us the failure of this perspective. What does that look like? First of all, a man-centered, short-term perspective is isolated on the present. Asaph became consumed with the here and the now. In verse 3, he tells us he became envious of the arrogant when he saw the prosperity of the wicked. And look at verse 12, sorry, look at verse 4 through 12. Let's look at how Asaph describes prosperity. It's an interesting choice of words, but he uses the word prosperity. And again, coming from a worldly perspective, here's what prosperity looks like. Verse 4, for they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. What's a pain? It's simply just a pain of some kind, some sort of physical or mental or emotional anguish. They are absolutely healthy and beautiful. It's interesting he uses the word, they are fat and sleek. We would not say that someone fat and sleek is beautiful. We would look for the, the slender, the skinny and sleek. But that's cultural there. Um, verse 5, it says, They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. So it appears to Asaph that these people never get into trouble and they never suffer. Verse 6, Therefore pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. So the prosperous, we're told, are proud and they're violent. Verse 7, the eyes swell, Their eyes swell through the fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. These, again, are individuals who withhold nothing from themselves. They indulge in anything and everything. They show no self-control. There's plenty of entertainment for these people, and they see and do whatever they want. Verse 9, or verse 8 through 9 says, They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongues strut through the earth. The prosperous are people who are reckless with their words and reckless with their tongues. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. These folks are never in trouble. They aren't held accountable for their actions. And they say in verse 11, How can God know? Is there any knowledge in the Most High? Essentially, the prosperous, those who are, who are 
prospering here that Asaph sees, they're mocking God. God can't see us. God is not aware of what we do. So Asaph is evaluating the wicked based on what has been created rather than on the creator. He's envious of them due to their present and personal happiness. He only notices what's visible about them, all the things that they have, their appearance, their possessions, the way they act, the way they seem to get away with all of their lying, their deceit, their mocking of God. And his, his observations, though, speak to us a truth that we read about in Romans chapter 1, verse 25. Paul writes, They exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and they worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. The key word here in this passage in Romans is exchanged. How easy it, is it for us to exchange God for His creation? And in doing so, we define the abundant life as happy as a happy present experience of created things. Whether that includes physical health, friendships, family, financial stability, emotional well-being, our focus has shifted off of God and off onto His gifts, onto the, off of the Creator and off, onto the created. And if the Christian life is not about gifts, though, and if it's not, what is it about? Look at Peter. In Second Peter, Peter writes this, he says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. So the chief good that God is doing is to deliver us from our bondage to sin. God is at work to radically change us at the level of our, of our hearts. He wants to change us from the inside, how we live and what fruit we bear. This is the work of redemption, the work that God and the Holy Spirit work in our lives. And he has given us everything we need to live a godly life in the midst of the situations and circumstances that we find around ourselves. We need to remember that God's focus for us is, is more redemptive. It's eternal and it's spiritual. To the degree that our focus is on those things, we are going to find ourselves at war with God. Are we looking at the world and evaluating their success, their prosperity, with the same focus that God has on their success and their prosperity? Verse 12, Asaph summarizes his observations. He says, Behold, look, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. This is how Asaph sees those around him. The wicked have the good life. They have material possessions. They are wealthy, they're prosperous, they're healthy. They live a life of ease. They live in sin with no consequences. They indulge themselves in whatever they, they want and they don't get any, into any trouble for it. They are content with their circumstances and Asaph finds himself jealous of them. He's jealous of what they have. He's jealous of the good life that they seem to be living. And we are guilty of the same thinking at times. Consider the following question. How would you finish this statement? The thing that would make my life good right now is... Fill in the blank. Or if I just had whatever it might be, then I would be happy. The wicked have the good life, according to Asaph. And that's what he sees. And it's a perspective that's isolated and focused on the here and now, on the present. Secondly... The, man inter, uh, the men-centered perspective that Asaph has is fueled by a, uh, by a self-centered comparison. He has just described his observations of the wicked. wicked. Now he starts to talk about himself and the conclusion that he comes to. In verse 13 he says, All in vain, all in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. And we can come to that same conclusion at time if we're not careful. And our, we can assume that our situations, we live out our situations, we can be staying, saying those same things in our heart. Asaph has done that here. I've tried to please God and to be obedient to Him, and it's all in vain, he cries out. What's the point of being godly? What's the value of living a God-honoring life? What's the advantage of being a Christian? What have I received as a result of all of my faith and all of my obedience and all of my worship? So here's the logic behind that kind of thinking. 
God, if he is good, will bless the righteous and punish the wicked. But all I see is the wicked prospering and the righteous suffering. Therefore, God is not good. What is it that you expect from God when you serve him faithfully, when you worship him, when you love him, when you pray without ceasing, when you give of your finances joyfully and generously, when you love your neighbors and your enemies, when you share with the poor and the needy, when you open your homes to hospitality, when you confess your sins, when you live ethically and morally, and you honor those in authority, what are you expecting? Are you hoping for a better job, a better relationship with your spouse, or maybe just a spouse? Perhaps you're hoping for children, or if you already have them, that they wouldn't embarrass you at the restaurant. Perhaps you're hoping for an end to some physical pain or suffering or some sort of illness. All of those are good, good things. But if that's all you're looking for, you've aimed way too low. All you hunters, if you go out and you're going bird hunting, the birds are usually up in the air. You don't aim at the ground hoping to hit the bird. God is at work in our lives for something much deeper and much grander. If we're looking for prosperity in this life, we're, we're aiming way too low. If we're looking for the same things that the wicked have, we have totally missed the target. God focuses on the process of making us good. We are tempted to judge his faithfulness, as Asaph is doing in this psalm, based on how many of our desires of life that we have had met and satisfied. What has God given, given to me? What have I received from him recently? But God is working to free us from our bondage to the desires of the sinful nature. God wants us to be free from those things so we can, we can want and desire him and him alone. Paul Tripp writes this. He says, The process of trial and suffering is no indication that God has forsaken his promises to us and is therefore not good. Rather, the process of trials, loss, and suffering that he ordains for us demonstrates his unshakable, faithful, redeeming love. He loves us enough that even in the face of, his, of us not getting it over and over, he will not forsake the work of his hands until that work is complete. These experiences preach his goodness, for they are the delivery system of his sanctifying work, which is, in fact, the good that he is doing. God is relentlessly committed to this good. It is only because we are committed to something else that we find it so difficult to call good a God who administers such a plan. How often do we find ourselves in Asaph's shoes? How often do we fall in the same line of thinking that Asaph found himself in? It's a common temptation to think that if we, all, if we do all the good things that we're supposed to for God, he somehow has to repay us and repay us immediately and in tangible, visible ways. There are singles here this morning that are committed and convicted about what relationships with the opposite sex look like. You're committed to not playing the dating game and not giving your heart away prematurely to someone who may only produce heartache, sorrow, and bad memories. You decide you're only going to pursue relationships that you believe God initiated and that might lead to marriage. Then as the years go by, you notice everyone around you is getting married but you. Even the non-Christians at work who have been dating anyone and everyone seem to find the perfect partner. And you wonder, is your waiting in vain? If you're a teenager here this morning and you obey your parents, you honor them, you seek to please them, you seek to please the Lord by honoring them, you don't go out partying on weekends. You, don't, you study hard. You clean your room. You help with the cleaning and the cooking. You're careful to honor and respect your parents. You seek out their counsel and their advice. You don't participate in all the wrong things that many of your peers are doing. You're trying to keep yourself from the world as best you can and maintain your purity. Then one day you come home a few minutes late and dad comes down on you hard. All of all the things I could have been doing, of all the things I could have been doing to disobey you, to get into trouble, all I did was come home a few minutes late. And you wonder, what was the point of all those years of obedience and work and honoring and trusting? The situations, and there's hundreds more we could all uh, think, think of in our minds. It's where this psalm hits us in our hearts this morning. All of these situations begin and end with a focus on me. I did this, I did that, it's I, I, I. 
And it's all about three close compassions, companions, me, myself, and I. And there's the problem. Anytime you place yourself at the center of the universe and try to interpret life around you, based on that perspective, it's time to duck. Trouble is on its way. When you place yourself at the center of the universe and try to interpret all that's going on around you, all of your circumstances, or even worse, try to interpret who God is based on your circumstances, it's a very dangerous place to find yourself in. With that perspective, it's easy, it's extremely easy to become disappointed and disillusioned. That's where Asaph finds himself in this psalm. His feet almost slipped. He almost fell. This perspective, third, and finally ends, uh, results in sin or leads to sin. Asaph confesses the sin of envy in verse 3. And it's certainly very arrogant of him to think that he has kept his heart clean in verse 13. He, remember, he said, all in vain have I kept my heart clean. Could you imagine saying something like that sincerely? We can understand the vanity of trying to obey God, but who can honestly say that I have kept my heart clean? It's arrogance on his words. Certainly he is, um, he's failing in unbelief. There seems to be some anger, some bitterness, and resentment in his words as well. How often do we find ourselves thinking the same thing in our hearts when we see the wicked? We are easily tempted to envy, to jealousy. And we find ourselves very close to slipping and falling off the edge as Asaph finds himself. The wonderful thing, though, is that the psalm doesn't end here. Asaph was searching for understanding, and we are going to see that that search is rewarded beyond all of Asaph's wildest expectations. We now have the picture of, of Asaph before. And something happens. Something happens to Asaph that, is totally, that will totally and completely change him. Asaph encounters God in his sanctuary, and we see a brand new man afterwards. He is now a God-centered, he now has a God-centered and eternal perspective on life around him. Picking up in verse 16 again, but when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until, big word, until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. Truly, you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterwards you will receive me to glory. Whom, I have, whom, have, whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all of your works. In verse 17, Asaph pivots. Here we find one word that changes everything for him. Until. Something is about to bring, something is about to bring a radical change to this man. He encounters God. He encounters the living God in his sanctuary, and it changes him radically. The radical encounter with God changes this man, changes his perspective from a, to an internal perspective off of the temporal, the immediate perspective, and he gets three results from this. The first is an awareness of the destiny of the wicked. It's impossible to make biblical sense of what is going on in our lives without this kind of perspective, without an eternal perspective. An eternal perspective is critical for us if we're going to interpret our circumstances and our situations. Asaph begins to wonder, to consider the eternal destiny, and to look at life from this vantage point. Without this perspective, we're going to look at our stash of goods, and we're going to compare that to the mountain of goods that, that others have, and we're going to be discouraged. How different our understanding of this picture is when we realize that what the wicked have is in the process of decay, it's rusting, and it's fading away. All and while what we have is an inheritance that will never fade. Asaph enters the sanctuary, and he comes away discerning the end of the wicked. Now he sees them differently. 
in a new, new set of eyes. His perspective has been transformed, and it changed him. And it will change ours as well when we encounter the living God. When we see how God sees, it changes how we see. So Asaph enters the sanctuary, and he comes away discerning the end of the wicked. Divine perspective changed him. So he uh, begins to notice that the ungodly are like people standing on a slippery slope. And it's one that they are going to go fall down. Have you ever watched someone try to cross a sheet of ice? They can go out gingerly across it, but you know what's going to happen. And when it does, you laugh. You aren't surprised by watching them slip. Their, their feet slide out from underneath them. We know that ice is slippery, and eventually they are going to fall. And that's the path that the wicked are on, according to Asaph, after he encounters God. Secondly, he compares the life of the wicked to a dream or a fantasy. When we're dreaming in the midst of the dream, it can seem real, it can seem like real life to us. But dreams are not real. Eventually, we're going to wake up, and the dream will be over. The prosperity of the believer is like that. It's only a dream. It seems like real life to them. It seems like reality. It seems permanent, but in a flash... It will be over and all gone. And the lasting eternal, eternal realities of life will close, close in on them. The unbelievers fix their eyes on what is seen rather than what is unseen. Quoting Paul Tripp again, he says, These two metaphors point us toward what God is doing as he expresses his redemptive love for his children. What is God working on? Is he working hard to provide us with the biggest pile of this world's stuff and this world's happy experiences? If so, he has miserably failed. Even worse, he has used his creative and redemptive power to give us only that which is doomed to pass away. Would this be the work of a good God? Would a good God motivate us to hope in things that are by their very nature temporary? Would he want us to stand on a slippery slope? Would he want our lives to be the passing fantasies of our sleep? Would he be good if he did anything less than to confront our powerful delusion of the permanence of this world. When we experience trials and suffering, we should see them for what they are, what they're intended to do. They are intended to explode the myth that what, is, that, that, all, that what we see in this life is all that there is to experience. The trials, the sufferings, and wants in life should not challenge our understanding of the love of God, of his justice and mercy. Remember how Asaph started his psalm? He said, Surely God is good to Israel to those who are pure in heart. So rather than having that truth challenged in times of difficulty, difficulty should remind us that life in this world is not where we find our satisfaction. We find our satisfaction in God. Asaph also sees the brevity of life and the terror that the wicked will experience at the end of their lives. There have been a lot of news story, so stories recently about how, that remind us how quickly and suddenly life can end from the Midwest, so I've been you know, paying attention. There's been a lot of tornadoes and flooding in the Midwest. A lot of people have lost their lives in that. There have been two plane crashes in the last year where over 600 people have perished. There was a shooting just a couple days ago in Virginia Beach, and 12 people were killed. Perhaps some of those who died in any of those incidents were the Lord's, and in God's providence, he used those, those things to, to usher them into his presence. But for others... Can you imagine the horrors of staring down a gunman and watching as he takes aim and pulls the trigger? Or can you imagine the feeling of helplessness trapped in a plane that is about to crash? In Ephesians 2, Paul reminds the believers that at one time they were separated from Christ, that we were alienated from the promises, we had no hope, and we were without God in this world. Those who went to work in the city offices in Virginia Beach on Friday or boarded those planes in the last few months. If they didn't know Christ, they perished not knowing God, and they perished without hope. Imagine not only the terror, not only that they were about to die, but the horrific fate that awaits them once they did die. They face an eternity separated from God. Secondly, Asas defined perspective. Divine perspective helped him not only to see the eternal destiny of the wicked, but also gave him a new understanding of himself. Verse 21 to 22, he says, When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Previously, 
Asaph compared himself to the wicked. Now he sees how he had responded to and carried on before God. When he was envious of the arrogant, he had allowed his soul to become embittered, to become brutish and ignorant. And he says, I was a, like a beast before God. He compares himself to a beast. If you know what a beast is, it's a pretty dumb animal um, that only lives basically in the moment. A beast is only aware of what's going on right now. It can't remember what just happened. It can't think and plan and rationalize what's going on around it. Their behavior is reactive rather than proactive. Anybody ever been to a rodeo? There's an event there that I always like to watch. It's, the, um, it's more one of the more thrilling ones. It's the bull riding event. So if you've ever seen that, seen a bull, I think many of us could agree that a bull is a beast of some kind. In, this, in the event, these cowboys, they climb up on these, on these bulls' backs and they strap their hands to a rope that's around the shoulders. And they, when they're ready, the gate, opens, the gate to the pen opens up and someone else pulls this, this other, other rope and it tightens up around the bull's groin and he just roars out of that pen and goes crazy trying to buck off that cowboy. But you know what? That, they use the same bull again tomorrow and the next time and the next week. And the bull never figures out what's going to happen when this cowboy gets on my back, he seems surprised each time when this happens. They're not able to think and realize what, you know, wait a minute. You know, the last 10 times this happened, I get this pain, this discomfort, and I roar out of here, and it doesn't do any good. Why don't I just stay here instead of getting crazy? They don't learn. They're not able to think. They live in the here and the now, and they completely forgot what happened yesterday. And Asaph said, I was like that before God. He says, that was me. I was a beast before, you, before the Lord until, until I encountered God in his sanctuary. And now I see things differently. And finally, Asaph's new eternal perspective brings an awareness of God's blessing on the righteous. Going back to verse 23, he said, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing. Listen to those words. It's far different than this man in the first few verses. And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. So what do we, the righteous, have that makes us rich? We have God. Asaph encountered God. We have encountered God. And that makes us rich. What makes us rich is not a collection of goodies. It's not wonderful kids. It's not a great job. It's not health. It's not good circumstances. We are rich because of this and this alone. We have a relationship with God through Christ. The God whose name is Emmanuel, God with us. That's the God that we have a relationship with. We can look at the wicked and see that, yes, many of them do seem to have burden-free lives. And yes, their wealth seems to increase. But I can say, I have God, but I have God. I'm upheld by his right hand. And I am guided by his counsel. When my flesh and my heart fail, God is my strength. He is taking me towards eternal glory. And it's God and God alone that makes me rich. So what do you want out of life? Is it a spouse? Is it riches, a new car, children, lots of free time, good health, a long retirement, traveling the world? These are not bad in and of themselves. But if that's all you're looking for and all that you're wanting... What makes you any different than an unbeliever? They all want those things as well. What do we want out of life? What do we really want and what do we really need? For Asaph, it began with a hunger for what the wicked had. Then he encountered God and what he wanted changed. There is nothing on earth that I desire, he, he claims here at the end. On this side of the cross, Jesus said to us, I will be with you to the end of the age, and I will never leave you or forsake you. All that the Father gives me are mine, and nobody will snatch them out of my hand. He will never turn his face from us. All because there was a day when obedience to his Father 
Jesus Christ went onto a cross, and it was that on that cross that he who no, knew no sin became sin. He was crucified, he was suffered, and he died. The Father turned his back on his Son and poured out the fury of his righteousness upon him, upon Christ, for our sins. And as he turns his face back to the Son, he turns his face back to us. The Lord blesses and keeps us and causes our face to shine on us when he lifts up his countenance on it and gives us peace. We are and forever will be with the Lord. We have been justified. All of our sin is credited, was credited to Jesus on the cross, and all of his righteousness has been credited to us. God made our hearts alive in him, and we are saved. He puts his Holy Spirit in us, and, become, and we become the temple of his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit guides us. The Holy Spirit counsels us. The Holy Spirit sustains us. The Holy Spirit convicts us. The Holy Spirit helps us, helps us to grow more and more into the likeness of our Savior. And to the end of this life, and at the end of this life, God will receive us, receive us into his glory. The moment of horror that the right, unrighteous face at death will for us be extreme excitement. To live is Christ, but to die is gain. Why? Because the very next thing that we will see when we, when we pass from this life to the next is the throne room of our God. And the face of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and his wounds that secured our redemption. One of the songs that we sing has this line in it. And it better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. How about, consider this, how about eternity in his presence? It's amazing what Asaph sees. God allows him to realize what is true about him and about us because of Jesus Christ. I think it makes sense to all of us in verse 25 that we join with Asaph in his worship. He says, Whom am I in heaven? Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. All that Asaph needed was God. All that we need is God. We have Christ in us, and that should be all that we need. How did you answer that question earlier when I asked you, if all I had was whatever it was that would make you feel like you've had success or joy or happiness in this life? I hope you discovered, if it's not today, then sometime soon, like Asaph, Asaph did, it's not the things of this world. It's not the possessions of this world. Asaph found that all he needed was God. And I hope that's my prayer, is that, all we'll, that we'll find that all we need as well is God. The correct question, answer to that question is this. If all I had in my life was God, then I would be happy. In closing, let me ask you a couple of questions. What are you consumed with this morning? When you look around and you see all the material and wealth and the possessions of the unbelievers, the wicked as, as Asaph called them, are you tempted to jealousy? When you wake in the morning, what's the orientation of your heart? What comes to mind first thing in the morning when you wake? What's, what's in your, what in your life keeps you awake at night? What causes you anxiety? What consumes your gaze? Secondly, do you find yourself envying the wicked this morning? Are you jealous or envious of what they have? If so, like Asaph, remember their life now is not much more than a dream. Don't lose sight of the horrendous end of those who don't believe in Christ. Lastly, what are the ways you are tempted to question the goodness of God as you look at your life? Do you question or doubt God's goodness to you? God must not really be good because of the financial things that I've challenged that I have haven't changed for years. He must not love me because I'm not married yet. He must not love me because, I, or maybe I'm being punished because I don't have kids yet. Or the kids we have are a challenge. Where are you tempted? How are you tempted to wonder and question about God's goodness or faithfulness to you? For those of us in Christ and those of us who are enjoying all the blessings of that reality, how can we question the goodness of God when we remember all the grace and the mercy that we've received at the cross? The salvation that has been secured for us will last for all of eternity. Joy and happiness beyond all that we can never dream or imagine awaits us for those who endure to the end, for those who are able to overcome. Every day that we wake up with our sins forgiven is a good day by default. Every day that we aren't going to experience the wrath of God that we deserve is a great day. 
even on the darkest days when it seems there is no end to our suffering, to that illness, to those pains, to the challenges. When we see the enticements of the world and the boasting of the wicked, we need to hold fast to the future glory that awaits the righteous. The slight momentary afflictions retold are preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this psalm. We thank you for the perspective that this man had. Lord, we see his, his heart. He's not afraid to, to confess the envy, the jealousy, the confusion that he, he felt as he looked around him and saw the wicked prospering. He confesses that he almost slipped, that he nearly fell. But Lord, then you came to him and he was able to encounter you in your sanctuary. And it changed his perspective. Lord, I pray that we would be reminded of all that we have in Christ this morning, that our perspective has been changed, that we too have encountered the living God. And Lord, help us to not live for the here and now, but to live for eternity, looking forward to the day that we will stand in your presence and worship you when our, when our faith will become sight. What a glorious day that will be. We look forward to it. We say, come, Lord Jesus. Amen.